Welcome back. On Tuesday, the Facebook whistleblower, Francis Haugen, told Congress that in the interest of making more money, Facebook eased some security safeguards just after the election and that it ended up helping to incite the January 6th Capitol riot. And Facebook changed those safety defaults in the run-up to the election because they knew they were dangerous. And because they wanted that growth back, they wanted the acceleration of the platform back after the election, they, re they returned to their original defaults. Well, joining me now is Facebook's Vice President for Global Affairs, Nick Clegg. Mr. Clegg, welcome to Meet the Press, sir. Morning. Uh, thank you. I want to get you to respond to that specific quote from Ms. Haugen, but I also want to uh, put something up that you wrote um, after uh, her initial 60 Minutes uh, appearance. She said, uh, this is also why the suggestion that is sometimes made that the violent insurrection on January 6th would not have occurred if it was not for social media is so misleading. Mature democracies in which social media use is widespread hold elections all the time. For instance, Germany's election last week, now two weeks ago, without the disfiguring presence of violence. I understand why you wrote that sentence, Mr. Clegg, but why put in the safeguards before the election if you didn't think if you guys at Facebook didn't think you had a role in potentially inciting folks? So just for, for folk who don't sort of follow this very closely, what we did in the run-up to the election was we put in, obviously, because it was an exceptional election happening at a, a, at a time of a pandemic, um, the, the obviously very stark polarization in this country, put in a number of exceptional measures. It's simply not true to say that we lifted those measures immediately. We, in fact, kept um, the vast majority of them right through to the inauguration, and we've kept some in place permanently. So, for instance, we permanently now don't recommend civic and political groups to people. But it's worth remembering what those exceptional measures are sort of like. It's a bit like closing all the highways and roads in a town because of a temporary one-off problem in one neighbourhood. Uh, you know, you, just, you don't do that on a permanent basis. And, and actually, some of those temporary measures we took, for instance, bearing down on the virality of, of videos, meant that we were just basically stopping the distribution of perfectly innocent videos. It had nothing to do with the election at all. So it was a mixture of permanent measures, measures which were one-off, which had to really sort of meet the moment for the elections. We did keep them up right through to, to, to the inauguration. It's not true to say that we immediately lifted them all. And actually, we're now going even further. So one of the things that we have heard from users both in the US and around the world since um, the, the election is that people want to see, if you like, more friends, less politics. So we've actually been looking and testing ways in which we can right. reduce the presence of, of politics on, on people's Facebook experiences. So I hope that's useful context from what we did and what we didn't do and what we're doing going forward. Well, why did you lift any of them, any of those procedures, considering what former President Trump was doing and saying and acting at the time? I mean, he was... He was a fire hose of misinformation. So why, why roll back any of those security provisions? And you clearly rolled back some. You want to dispute that you didn't roll them all back. I, that's fine with me. Why'd you roll back any of them? Well, as I explained, because some of them were very, very blunt tools, which were basically scooping up a lot of entirely innocent, legitimate, legal, playful, enjoyable content. And, and we did that very exceptionally. It's a bit like sort of sort of throwing a blanket over the whole whole platform. We just simply let perfectly normal content just circulate less on our platform. And that's something we did because of the exceptional circumstances. I think it shows how sort of precautionary and responsible we were trying to be at the at the time. As you will also remember, we stopped uh, running any new political ads for a week in the run-up to the election. We labelled huge amounts of uh, content, including content from Donald Trump. Of course, subsequently, yeah. we've said that Donald Trump is not able to use our platform for at right. least two years. So I don't think anyone can claim we haven't taken a lot of exceptional measures to meet those very exceptional circumstances. I want to get to the issue of labelling misinformation. Why are that you still allow the misinformers to get their information up? I, I, you know, shouldn't there be just a flat policy? If you're a known misinformer, whether it's on COVID uh, or the election, you know, whether it's one strike, two strikes, three strikes, maybe you can decide how many times you intentionally misinform. Throw them off. I mean, you guys seem to always want to find a way to get these to keep these folks on. How does a warning label help? Keeps the misinformation out there. Sure. So, so, I mean, the, the first thing to say is, of course, if someone keeps saying things which leads to real-world harm, we kick them off. 
and we do that on a very, very significant scale. I think on a far more significant scale than any other part of the, the industry. So you're, you're quite right. If someone is doing, saying stuff which is going to lead to real world harm, that is simply not permitted on our, our platform. We bear down very aggressively on hate speech. I mean, in recent years, because of the 40,000 people we now empl empl employ to do this work, 40,000 people is, what, more than twice the number of staffers who work on Capitol Hill. We've invested $13 billion in this, in this integrity work to bear down on misinformation and hate speech. That, I mean, again, for context, that is more than the total revenues of Twitter over the last four years. And that's actually been successful. Hate speech, the prevalence of hate speech, the presence of hate speech on Facebook now stands at 0.05%. That means for every 10,000 bits of content that you'll see on Facebook, only five will be hate speech. I wish we could bring it down to zero. We're not going to do that because we're not, you know, we, we can't, with, with a, th a third of the world's population on our platforms, of course you're going to see the good, the bad and the ugly yeah. of human nature on our platforms. Our job is to mitigate and reduce the bad and amplify the good. And I think those investments, that technology and some of that evidence of how little hate speech there now is compared yeah. to a few years ago shows that we are, we are moving in the right direction. I want to go to the issue of how to regulate Facebook. Uh, the, the founder yeah, and CEO sure. wrote this, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. He said, similar to balancing other social issues, I don't believe private companies should make all of the decisions on their own. That's why we have advocated for updated Internet regulations for several years now. We're committed to doing the best work we can, but at some level, the right body to assess trade-offs between social equities is our democratically elected Congress. Uh, on one hand, this, seemed, this is a very reasonable statement. On the other hand, it sounds like Facebook is saying, we're not going to do much until Congress tells us what to do. Do you want Congress to write Facebook's moral and ethical code? No, no, no. I'm, we're not advocating regulation as somehow to sort of divest ourselves of our own responsibilities. Of course, with the success of a big global platform like Facebook comes accountability, comes scrutiny, comes criticism and comes responsibility. And that's why we make those very considerable investments uh, that, I, that I said. That's why we are being ever more transparent in how our systems operate so that people can hold us to account. We're the first company, for instance, every 12 weeks to publish data on all the content that we act on, that we remove and so on, and to actually subject that to independent audit. But there are certain things that no private company can do. Only lawmakers can pass federal privacy legislation. We don't have nationwide federal privacy legislation in this country, which we clearly need. You do have it in other jurisdictions like Europe, uh, but not here. Only, only uh, uh, um, lawmakers can pass legislation to, to strike the right balance so that if we move, uh, uh, people move data from one platform to the other, which is good for competition, you strike the right balance with the privacy safeguards, which should be in place at the same time. That has to be enshrined in law. Only lawmakers can create a digital regulator, which we believe would be a good thing. So absolutely, you're, you're right. We're not saying this is, this is somehow a, a substitution for right. our own responsibilities. But there are a whole bunch of things that only regulators and lawmakers can do. And at the end of the day, I don't think anyone wants a private company to adjust Adjudicate on these really difficult trade-offs, but between you know free expression on the one hand and and moderating or removing content on the other, about which, as you know, there is fundamental political disagreement. The right thinks we take down too much content, we censor yeah. too much content. The left thinks we don't take down enough. In the end, we make the best judgment we possibly can, but we're slightly caught in the middle in this political debate. In the end, lawmakers have to resolve that themselves. All right, Nick Clegg, uh, the vice president of Facebook. Appreciate you coming on uh, and sharing Facebook's Thank uh, you. perspective here. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.